this is Gary Vaynerchuk and this is episode 294 of the Ask Gary V Show. This is an exciting episode for me. As you can see, I'm perched outside my office. I have a small group of friends here. We did a really fun barter party for the uh, clouds and dirt. Uh, so I wanna first, let's clap it up for each other. Really nice crew here. I know we're live on Facebook as well. We're gonna probably take most of the questions from here and I have two wonderful guests here and I'll explain in a minute why. Uh, one reason is I'm very excited about doing their event which we'll bring a little bit of awareness to but the gentleman here to my right with the help of the gentleman here to my left, if, if, if I could think about how many individuals are out there, if, if one looks back in 20 or 30 years and says, wow, crush it, was a book that was written about social media that really kind of nailed it and created a blueprint that I then followed and created companies, followed myself. If there's people outside of me who've executed, and many of you are in the process of doing that, and many of you watching even more so, but if, if, if you asked me in 20 years, and definitely today, to speak to the individual or individuals that best executed against the thesis, it's very difficult for me to think of a name better and and doing it longer and more importantly authentically from reading actually crush it to changing their lives to then jumping early on platforms and executing then building around it. It's very difficult for me to think of somebody who's done it better than Sean Doris and so I'm very happy that he's here so let's clap it up for him on that. Thanks man. Someone get that on camera. I need that clip. <laughs> Uh, and so for the Vayner Nation that's watching and some of the people in here that may not know who you are, why don't you two beautiful men introduce yourselves. I gave you a little context. Why don't you yeah, yeah. jump on it? So I'm a professional wrestler going by the name of... No, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I started out on social media. I did the Snapchat thing. I was one of the first Snapchat pioneers, did the very first brand deal with Snapchat, kept pushing the limits going from there, built an entire community, built the ecosystem for what was Snapchat brand deals and how we worked with brands and partnerships. Um, a lot of that was through Gary. From Snapchat, I, I learned I wanted to diversify, get something more scalable. Went over to YouTube, that seemed more long term, but it still didn't have the scalability that I wanted to. So I continued going. Now we have a full talent management agency. We're really big into esports. We've got Space Station Gaming and uh, continue to build other businesses outside of just social media. We have a conference coming next month that Gary's going to be a speaker at. Yeah, when is and, it? What uh, is it? Holiday is the guy here who helped me yeah, yeah. do all of it. Yeah, so Vid Summit is the conference they're referencing to in LA, uh, October 9th through the 12th. Gary speaks on the 10th, so if you're gonna come, come the 10th. <laughs> uh, so a little bit about myself, traditional startup guy, had raised money before with companies, uh, had made every effort to get in front of this guy, would come to these types of events, try to bump, rub shoulders with him at, you know, when he'd speak, and now on stage with him, which is amazing. So. About a year, two years ago, started with just Sean. Had I literally didn't know people made money on YouTube. So I was like, oh, he didn't you can know make who money. PewDiePie like, was when he came to work for me. I'm like, all right, let's dig into YouTube. So like, you know, PewDiePie. And he's like, wait, who? I was like, all right, so we I, got a lot of work to I do. I didn't know who Casey was. Like, really, really oblivious to kind of the scene. Came on with Sean from like a business perspective, not as much like, oh, I want to get famous. I want to get numbers. And from that business perspective, I had one goal, which was make money and scale. And so we jumped in with Sean started making money and scaling, which was amazing. And then from there, found that there was so much like overflow off of Sean. And so we started picking up, one of those overflows was from Gary. So Gary would kick some stuff, uh, kind of unique opportunities and invitations and kind of connections. And then we took and started saying, wait, what if we worked with other influencers? And so we started working with other influencers and from there we built a talent management called Space Station Integrations. Now we work with some of the biggest talent on YouTube. So, Sean, started. You Sean, talk to me about the jewelry company after you read Crush It. Oh, I was gonna keep that one a secret. <laughs> bring it, bring it, bring it, because I think it's super important, because I think for a lot of people that are watching, and for even a bunch of us in this room, like, I started off as a wine retailer. I think the thing that most people struggle, and when I look around this room, like, all of us have one to three more chapters in us, I think people struggle with understanding how deep the, innovation and disruption that the internet is actually causing. I think that a lot of people see the final result but they don't understand the steps that take there. So 
off gotcha. of reading Crush It, what were you doing and then what did you do next? So I was in college because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but I wanted to do something really cool, right? And uh, my teacher had me read Crush It by this guy named Gary V or something. So I was like, all right, let's read this thing. Read it. I was like, oh, dang, this is incredible. I need to figure this stuff out. So I started running my own business. It was a skateboard snowboard shop. Coolest part about owning a skateboard snowboard shop. You literally just chill and watch snowboard videos all day. It's dope. <laughs> Worst part about owning a snowboard shop. You literally just chill and watch videos all day. You don't sell anything. It's not dope. So... Crush It helped me realize there's so much more out there. There's different platforms where you can share a message, sell a product, give a service, whatever. And that's when I wanted to try something new. So I wanted to figure out the internet. Internet was killing my sales because everyone bought their stuff online, free returns, everything else. So I wanted to figure out how can I sell skateboard snowboards online? After reading Crush It, I was like, wait, this isn't the best idea. This is working harder, not necessarily smarter. I love snowboards, but doesn't mean I need to sell them. So I really put together a business plan of what would be the most effective way to start my first online business. And uh, I came to the conclusion of jewelry. It was small, it was lightweight, there was a huge market for it. And the platform I chose to build my business on was Facebook at the time, like kind of the very first social media platform that really hit hard. I ran the entire jewelry boutique, uh, jewelry boutique under my wife's name because I thought it was a little creepy, like skater kid running a jewelry <laughs> boutique out the back of his shop. So. It was all under her name, you know, Rainy Day. I'd be like, all right, ladies, like, what movie are you going to watch today? And they'd be like, The Notebook. And I'd be like, already seen it. And like, <laughs> it got weird, guys. But it taught me a lot about building a business and the power of social media. So from there, I was like, oh, this is the real deal. Scaled that one year, was able to sell it, had actual money in my pockets, paid off student loans, and started what would be my next business which was in social media and that's where I identified Snapchat and took it from there. So from reading Gary's book, Crush It, to executing on that, finding success, digging deeper, and then I was, you know, I was just bragging, I'm the very first quote in crushing it. So, you know, only one person has the first quote in crushing it, so it's, it's me. It's limited real estate, Sean. Yeah. So how did you get to Sean? Like, so you're a startup kid, you're playing in that world. What, how'd you find Sean, what, what, yeah. what played out? Yeah, so a little background, Sean and I, like Sean Duras, the name, was from a mission that we went to in Honduras. So when he got home, they called him Sean from Honduras, Sean Duras. So that's kind of the, the history of the name. So we knew each other there just a little bit. Uh, nothing crazy, though. When I got back, I was running my startup and was super deep, and Sean was coming into town for a brand deal in Mesa, Arizona. He's like, hey, can I stay with you? I don't want to stay at this hotel. I was like, sure. So we slept on the floor at my house. Oh, we, we didn't sleep. How? We stayed up all night talking. After we stayed up till four. <laughs> the plan was to sleep on the floor. So you stayed up till four. Is that how you rolled back then? Like you wouldn't want to go to hotels? You just like. Oh yeah, I just everything's networking connections, old friends. I saw he was killing it. He had his own startup business that crushed it. And I was like, dude, I want to learn from you. Like I'm doing the Snapchat thing. You did your thing. Like let's hang out and jam. Spent the whole night talking. Next thing you know, I'm like, dude, I'm getting way deep into public speaking. I was kind of trying to be Gary's understudy at the time. And if Gary didn't do a deal, I would do a deal. We spoke at a couple events together. And I was like, dude, I want to crush public speaking. His previous business was an app that turned your phone into a microphone. So anyone out there, you know, just pulls up their phone, asks a question, super simple. I was like, you know the speaking world. Help me do this. And he helped me do it. He helped me get my first speaking gig, got me a TED Talk, provided all this value, no payment. And I was like, dude, this guy hustles. How do I get him on my team? So I was like, yo, what would it take you to move you out, you and your family yeah. out to Utah? Real, real quick for everybody watching and listening on the podcast, before we started this episode with the group of 17, 25 people that are here, I said, look, before you leave, make sure you say hello, because I've been watching them for the last hour and a lot of people haven't said hello to each other. I, I, you know, I love when you, you know, Instagram is this limiting platform for me, which is why the most motivational version of myself is on that platform. With one minute video being the length and when pictures and quotes, there's only one part of what I can show there, but there's a quote that I put on Instagram and just says, you know, people are the ROI, right? And you know, you can only do so much to explain a post, even with long copy, and I do that, of what that purpose is. But it's interesting to me in what I tried to pressure this room to do over the next two to three hours is exactly what you did, which is, people are the ROI. And I, I think what's super fascinating to me as we become more and more digital, the sleeping over somebody's house, the random dinner meetups, events like this, and anything everybody in here or watching or listening right now can do to put them in a place with like-minded people is like disproportionately the right thing to do. 
Yo, you guys want to know a cheat code for that? I've been using this for years and it works. I, I already use it on some of you guys out here, so don't get weirded out. But I go around, talk to everyone I can, have the most meaningful five minute conversation where I'm listening, I'm not on my phone. I figure out exactly who you are, learn from you, become friends. And then I go, oh dang, is there food around here? I'm looking for some food. Dude, I'm gonna go find some food. I'll catch you later. Then I walk just down, start talking to someone else. Five minutes, yo, is there food around here? I'm trying to get some food. And then that way you don't get caught in a 30, I want to so talk wait, to real all quick, of you for 30 for minutes. For all the people but, listening and watching, in the future, when you pull the food card, that means you're ready to move on from them? Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool, just wanted to make sure. I love all of you, but I don't wanna to talk to you for 30 minutes. I wanna to talk to everyone here for five minutes and to end that conversation, yo, is there food? Are those drinks? I'm gonna go check those out, but you never actually get food. You just keep hopping around. That's and look, I think, I think for a lot of people that are listening or watching, I think not everybody's extroverted and can do that, right? You hear that with his energy, and it's like, cool, that works for him. I think. It's really interesting to learn skills or like break your habits. To me, it's one thing to have that ability to work a room for real. There's a whole nother thing that I'm most fascinated by which is what's happening here right now physically which is you're already here. Like it's, you know, it's one thing to like have that ability. Like if you're actually there and to me the whole like-minded you know, events, like to me, Going to a huge networking thing like business networking sucks because it's so, not that it sucks, it's not as conducive to what I'm trying to push everybody to do because the concept is very broad. Whereas if you go to an event that is around an individual or a very long tail event like Super Mario Brothers 2. Like if you go to a Super Mario Brothers 2 meetup, Everybody's there for fucking Super Mario Brothers 2. Like you should be able to have a lot of conversations because you're so long tail. So a business event versus a cryptocurrency meetup around one single currency that's nine weeks old and there's 15 people there. If, you're, if you find yourself introverted, I can't tell you enough how important it is to find the long tail of your interests because it's gonna make you feel more comfortable because the context is so deep. The, the group might be smaller, but the ability for you to interact becomes greater. So just something to think about. Or everyone loves food, just be like, yo, is there food here? And start talking to them. <laughs> Fair enough, so how did you find him? So he yeah. found you. Yeah, I showed up the house and I was You running, guys had a slumber party. <laughs> running, scaling this business, and I remember we wrote down on this piece of paper till like four in the morning, like, here's the verticals of my business. I'm focused on, for Sean, it was Snapchat, YouTube, and then he had this vertical that was speaking. He's like, I just don't have the time or effort or team, like I, I just can't pull it off. And at this time it was just him and an editor, right? And they were doing all this YouTube and Snapchat stuff. And so I was running a company at the time in the event world and I said, let me just jump in. So Alex, who's in the back here, uh, was a buddy at the time, and he started kind of helping me navigate that world a little bit. And so we got Sean a TEDx. We spoke three times uh, right after Gary. So Gary would speak, and we would go to the event and say, "Hey, he's like he'd great. like warm him up, and then I was the we're keynote great with Gary." And so he would Sean would speak right after Gary. Oh, well, I'm still running my own company. I right? just added value. So when I came down to got rid, sold the startup, and we were moving on. First guy, Sean calls, is like, yo, dude, congrats, like, come be on my team. And I had already had 12 months of connection, hustle, value, and so it was a really easy transition. We knew how to work with each other, we knew how to do it, and I, I never made a dollar off of him. Never. So for me, especially having everybody here, where I wanna transition into is heavy Q&A, and I'll tell you why. I think what I'm setting up here, what my personal kind of mission is, is I'm starting to realize, especially over the last week or two, I've been thinking quite a bit about this, which is the maturity of building infrastructure around a personal brand is pretty remarkable, right? Like, if I wasn't running Vayner full time, I, I started realizing, my God, I'd probably have 55 full time people in Gary V Inc. And like, that means that in 15 to 20 years, you know, the, the model of like, you know, it's happened, right? Whether it's an Oprah or, or you know, so many other things that have, uh, uh, Newman, right? You know, Paul Newman, like, the, the amount, and you can go on and up, Jordan, I mean, Brand Jordan, like, I think the long tail of human ink is far greater than people realize. I think these that we are in the you know national anthem of an 18 inning game of like what a business looks like. I think we've all realized especially over the last decade, oh crap, as a personal brand, you can speak, you can write books, there you can get you can be a YouTuber and get tons of pre-roll ads. I don't think people realize the maturity of how far this goes when you go into merch and IP and just disproportionately, I think over the next four to five decades, we will see 100, 500, $4 billion companies built around a human. Yeah. We've seen 
a couple be able to do that in a traditional landscape, but way more important to everybody watching and everybody here, how about 100,000? So for me, what's super interesting to me is how many people in America, let's just stick with America, would rip their arm off to make $100,000 a year, a lot. Or more importantly, how many people make 127,000 a year being something that they hate and how much they would love to make 100,000 a year being a baker or a candle maker or like a shoe expert or the foremost expert on Space Jam, right? And so to me, I, what I'd like to do, uh, knowing a lot of this audience, I'm, I'm thrilled, Seth, Seth, if we want to take questions from Facebook, but specifically here, let's open it up. Who's got a question around personal brand or that thematic if you're in here now? Hands. Let's move the mics. Who's got them? All right, Sinan, get your going. Name and question. My name is Barack Johnson. So. My question is at what point do you, so at a certain point you get one to two people to help you, yes. but then at a certain point it gets to where it scales and then it's like you have to hand it off from being you. And that point, like how do you transition from zero to one and then that one to six and beyond of that building the infrastructure of human ink like you're talking about? Oh, I got this because I did it. I was <clears throat> just me, just Sean Duras, and I couldn't film all my videos and be talking and running a new company and doing all this stuff. So I connected him with everyone I knew, I gave him access to everything I had access to, and then I let go of creative control. Because that's what you have to do. If, if I want him to send an email the way I want to send it, it's not going to work. I teach him what my voice is, but then I give him full creative control. And I'll tell you, he one of my businesses, he runs it more than I do. He knows more about it than I do, and he's scaled it bigger than I ever thought it would go, because I gave him full control, and then took away my creative, my, my creative control, I guess. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, there's this certain level of control, but I think the other part is like, who is on that team, right? Uh, finding the right culture fit. Like Sean and I are just best friends from- We have the same birth, first name. Right? Yeah. And uh, like- There it is, folks. I think that's- <laughs> Great news, just hire for. people with your first name and away you go. It's all billions after that. So I think it's it's really comes down to- Brock's gonna be hard. You've met, oh. yeah, good luck. You know, you've met a lot of Gary's team and, and a lot of them have the same vision and culture and like s not just ingrained in them from Gary, but like from birth, right? And just some of those assets you have to find and have. And so I would say as far as not from one to, you know, that, but finding that one, I think that one really has to be uh, ingrained in what you are and the culture you have, because that one's going to get two and then that two is going to get four and four, six, eight, and on and on and on. Gary's proved it with 900, but that first couple are really, really Crucial. important. For me, there's a couple of things, right? So something interesting has been happening in my team. Uh, D-Rock and I were, uh, uh, you might have saw if you're following closely, I was garage sailing this Saturday and Lou, who's not here, who's, his name is Little Lou to me because I've known him since he was six. His dad was my friend in the wine business. I've literally known him since I was six. He's worked here since he was 18 and didn't go to college. Like He's like been here for five, six years. He's like one of my Jets friends, so he's like a real friend. And I just know him extremely well. Like He's like one of the kind of like people I really know. So he was with us. If you were hardcore watching, he was the one holding up the teddy bear in the background this weekend when I found the $20 angry bear. Anyway, and D-Rock, are you here? Okay, I think this is right. I think, this is right, I think Lou, so this Saturday, is this right, Sinan, you know where I'm going? I was in the car, in between garage sailing, posting on Instagram. Like, the post was in, we have a system, like a text chain, a system, we have a fucking text chain, <laughs> where, where, there's, where there's a bunch of creative that we work on together, uh, there's a lot of the team here, and I picked the one I liked, and I started writing the copy, and little Lou, who I've known for 20 years, who's worked here for the last six, who's like always around, is like sitting in the back, because D-Rock's in the front seat, and he goes, what are you doing? And I go, I'm post, you know, I thought he meant why am I wasting a few minutes because we have to get quickly get to the next garage sale because we don't want somebody to take some good shit. I was like, oh, I'm just gonna quickly post this Instagram, like I'll be, you know, I gotta post this. He goes, you post your own Instagram? <laughs> so, 
The, so the answer is yes, and I, th- I write all the copy, and I think people realize how bad my grammar is, so I think they f- understand that, but I still don't think they believe it or they think somebody does it. I think the biggest thing that I think about when scaling is what do you keep and what do you let go? And that has to be individual. The way you scale is by realizing five people doing an 80 of your 100 is better than just you doing 100. And so first and foremost, it starts with ambition. So for example, a lot of people say shit like, oh, don't look at Gary Vee, he has 20 fucking people. Like that's why, he, you know, what, but what they don't realize is first of all, and Andy, I'm trying to look for you, and Seth's blocking me, but like the reality is like in its truth, and a lot of the teams here, in its truth, we could be remarkably efficient doing what we're doing with six or seven. The reason I have 20 is I'm training a lot of them to infiltrate the overall organization in the long term. I have 20 because I want, you know, because Babin right now is working, has been working, if you haven't noticed, he hasn't been around in the content, he's working with Vayner Talent, one of our divisions. And 1.37 p.m. is something I have enormous ambition for, and whether it's Sinan or Sid, or there's just so many people, Jake, there's so many people on the team here that I know can go and dominate there, but I'd like them to get incubated for six months to a year or two and really fucking know it. So my ambition, is to buy the New York Jets, and so creating scale and being inefficient with 20, and we are plenty fucking inefficient with the amount of people we have, and that's why everybody's smiling, is still ROI positive because I'm gonna scale them to the, you know, to the 900. I think you need to know what your ambition is, first and foremost, and then I think you need to hold on to what you value the most. I, on Instagram and Twitter, Every single one of those posts are me and I need it to be me and I have to have it be me and like it means a lot to me that it's me and that's what means something to me and so, you know, that's just the way it is. So I think you need to think about what you wanna be doing with your time and what you value and then you start building a team around you that has complementary skills to the things, and I go one of two ways. Either they're very like you, and for me, to what you mentioned, I saw people shaking their heads. To me, where my team has to be very like me is they have to be nice. Not super complicated. I'm completely suffocated in negativity. Thus, if I'm the fucking engine, I don't care if somebody's the greatest growth hacker or can fucking design his fucking Pablo Picasso. If Pablo Picasso's a fucking dick, he's out. (laughs) Um, That's what has to be like me. Everything else has to be not like me. Like, you have to be able to read an email. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, and, and many other things, right? And so, you know, I think that you have to, ego is what holds back people from growing, right? They like the feeling, in companies, in, and personal brands are tough, right, because it's you. So like, I'm not comfortable with somebody writing on my behalf. Like, I have to say everything I say. Like every piece of content is transcription from my words. Like people are like, oh, like I always read the reviews, they're like, oh my God, this book sounds just like you, Gary Vee. I'm like, right. Like it's literally, like the ghostwriter is literally just making it grammar. It's transcriptions. So I think that's what you have to think about. Okay, so I, I, I don't have to feel guilty about my Slack channels just being really unorganized. So it's just, you really focus on speed and people like you. Yeah, I mean, to me, to me, like, you need to be you. Like, everybody's gonna always win most if they lean in more to what they are instead of trying to do something that they see somebody else doing well and be ideological about it. In art and sports, we've accepted that we're not LeBron or Beyonce, right? For some reason in entrepreneurship, we have this false feeling that we can be. We have not layered the talent card into the entrepreneurial creative land to the level that I think we need to. Like everybody just thinks that they're gonna make a million dollar business, that it's so easy in a way that we don't with putting out a rap album or playing basketball. And uh, and that's a day of reckoning that needs to happen in this space to help everybody. Um, For me, I'm only comfortable in chaos. Like there's a report card hanging there in my office you know, for a couple reasons. One, I just think it's hilarious, but more importantly, you know, I'm not going to be organized. That's not what I get paid to do. That's not who I am. I feel no bad about that whatsoever. I want to find people that are comfortable in their organization. And I'll, I'll tell you, Andy, who's my right hand and the guy, I've watched him not get less organized. I've watched him and everybody else on my team prioritize better because 
they, they start off more organized and then I systematically, in osmosis, take out of them to not focus on dumb shit. Even though they're the one in charge of the more, and they have to care more than I do, but no, I don't think you beat your, I mean, beating yourself up around your DNA is such a negative exercise. What you need to do is figure out what you naturally do best and quadruple down on that and then build infrastructure around it. I genuinely believe that. The end. That's why, that's why I love Q&A. That's why, that's why I struggle with some of the stuff I put out because I hate that I can't have full context. That's why I love Q&A. I need the context. I, the best advice I give are to people I know the best. Questions? Yep, here, I'll give you mine. So you got, your, your personal brand is, uh, my name is Alan Barubi, I'm from um, Saco, Maine, and uh, I was wondering about your branding, your name. So have you, did you just say, hey, I'm gonna brand my name, was there another business idea that you thought maybe it was gonna be the brand instead? Because you know, it really puts a lot of emphasis on you uh, and when you brand your name, you're kind of stuck with that, right? You, you can't change it. You can't change it. Look, you can't change it as in, to me I love the name because I actually think it gives you disproportionate flexibility to do anything. As a human, if you go from wine guy to social media guy to like whatever you want to do next, I think it gives you that flexibility whereas if you're like the photo expert and then you want to write, you're like, oh fuck. Right, so like when I look to people go literal with their brands versus I'm um, Sally Thompson or Rick Jones, I think, sure, you need to do a little work, but I think what I, what I mean by a little work is your actions become your brand. Like, if you go read the early, like if you go back to 2009 and go on Twitter, people shit on me for like, but you're the wine guy, you can't start a social media agency. I'm like, why? I'm like, over time my actions will make me that brand. Today, way more people know me as an entrepreneur than they do as a wine guy. But the first year of my existence in the transition, I got shit on at scale for making that transition. But that's like Marky Mark becoming Mark Wahlberg. Like, The Rock is less of a wrestler today than he was 10 years ago, right? So what I always tell people is, whatever you are now, your execution's gonna define you. So like, to me, I'm not scared of it for that reason. And you didn't get stuck to being the wine guy, you just wrapped everything around wine at that point. I guess Gary Vee could be anything at that point. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think, again, there's so much that goes, there's so many funny stories. First of all, the Gary Vee thing is really funny to me. First of all, it's a terrible name in the way I spelled it because there's two silent E's. Like, it's just like a bad idea for a brand, right? <laughs> Number two, it's funny how it went down. I tried to register for Twitter four months earlier than the first time I registered for it. Literally, I saw it, and like I tried to register for it, and the Wi-Fi in London didn't work, and I just like was like, fuck it. And I like got back to it four months later, and the first time I had just Gary. And the second time it was taken, I, and I never, talk about some, like I love how life works. In my life, I had never, ever tried to register Gary VEE. -E. I don't even know where it came from. I have no idea why I did it. It ended up being fucking Twitter. Plurk and Schmirk and fucking all the other, MySpace, all the other shit, it, you know, Friendster, but this was the one that put me on and then that became me. Um, so I didn't think about the brand name. Like names to me, are like when I watch entrepreneurs and individuals think about names too much, I laugh because I'm like, what does Facebook mean? What does Nike mean? Like no, nothing means shit. You, like in, when it first starts, the execution defines it. McDonald's is an Irish pub, right? So like, you know, like it's the execution. And so that's how I think about branding your name. Like if today you're a lawyer and in, in four years you wanna be a clown and then nine years later you wanna be the foremost expert in bourbon, it is your execution and your talent that will define that over time. In the same way that Justin Timberlake isn't from NSYNC. You know what I mean? Like. Your skills are what predicate the outcome. And I think people get caught up in like a name, which is a quick tell of like not seeing what actually plays out when building brand. 
I didn't even choose my name. It just kind of happened and then I've had to roll with it, but I could choose my mantra, what I'm all about. I have the best day ever and I give everyone high fives and I'm always positive and like, that's what I could decide. And that's really all that matters. Like the name just kind of comes with it. Sean Duras, Dr. Duras, might get into medical, I don't know, just whatever sticks. <laughs> Questions? Who's got the mics? Go ahead, go ahead. Hey, my name is Emery from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, my question is, what was your biggest internal or external struggle with building your brand from the beginning, like when you were just starting out? Hey, we talked for five minutes before I got food. What's up? We did. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it was that scalability. I started most of my first business ventures were very heavy on me. And it wasn't until I met Holiday that I didn't realize, like, it's not just a matter of working harder and working harder. You need to build a team. And we just talked about how to do that correctly. And that was my number one thing that was hard is because, and you notice earlier, I, I stress like giving away creative control. It's because for me, that was the hardest thing because I am a creative and I want my videos to look like this and my emails to look like this and everything else. And I'm like, Gary, I have the things that my social media is me. I post that, but everything else, I need to have a team backing me and I need to trust in my team. I need to train them to do what I think is right for the company, but in, when it comes down to it, they need to do what their gut check is and I need to trust them on that. And Holiday's made so many decisions that I had no idea was, what, what was happening and they've all worked out to be amazing and now we've scaled multiple businesses side by side. All of them? What? 100%, he's never <laughs> stopped. Andy's made like three good ideas and like <laughs> 900,000 wrong calls. Um, so my answer is pretty interesting. I think you'll find it fascinating. I sat on the idea of, DRock was like, we gotta vlog, we gotta vlog, Casey's the best, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I'm not gonna fucking, I'm too busy, I'm like fucking busy. Every minute is like programmed, like, I'm not gonna walk around with a camera. And so when it came to, huh, should I have DRock follow me around and film it? It was no question one of the biggest challenges for me to go, because don't forget, this is now three plus years ago. And the thought of like now, like what's going on, but like, it's not super complicated. This is why what's so fun about the internet is everything's documented. People weren't rolling with somebody else filming them. People were rolling like Roman and like small cameras, right? right? So it was far, you know, he was, just even having the handle was like felt big. Yeah. These were small cameras, right? That was vlogging. And so I'm like, ooh, I'm gonna introduce a man following me and filming me at all times. I knew that 98%, and don't forget, forget about being a creator and an influencer. I'm an actual business, like C-suite executive going to meetings with like 58 year old conservative like C-suite executives and like here's D-Rock, he's filming this meeting. Like, the, like that just was super unacceptable or walking down the street. So it was a really interesting conversation with myself for about a month of holy fuck, I think I figured this out. If he films me, I can make unlimited content. I'll have a vlog, I'll be able to have articles, I could do a podcast, like it all came to me pretty quickly of like this is the gateway to like unlimited being a media company. Film everything and the first place I went is this is gonna be fucking amazing because my grandkids are gonna watch this. The next place I went is like everybody's gonna think I'm a dick face. Like it's gonna take me a good year to like have to eat shit where everybody thinks I'm a douchebag and a narcissist but I'm completely convinced everyone's gonna do this that everybody who can't hold it is gonna have somebody film them. And like literally told D-Rock on episode one, like dude, in four years, we're gonna be sitting in meetings where everybody's gonna have a film person filming the person. It's gonna be six people in the room in a three person meeting. And it's when it happened, started happening 18 months ago or so, we like kinda have some good chuckles. But basically, almost everything I've done in my career, when I was an 18 year old kid and I'm pushing to launch a website for my dad's liquor store and we're part of a liquor co-op, and everybody wants us to open a second store, I knew everybody was gonna shit on my idea of selling wine on the internet, something they didn't even know existed or was a fad at best. So for me, like business decisions, struggles, like the macro has always been cake. I'm an entrepreneur, I don't give a fuck about what anybody thinks about me, I'm good in life, game over. In the micro, which is far more secondary, which is why I push so many people to not give a fuck, because then everything becomes easy. Um, it, there, it's an everyday thing. There's 46 things I'm struggling with right now. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Let's push it back there. Thank you. 
Chefflezette. New York City. Okay, so I love the tactical questions, and I really want to get all of your perspectives. Literally from like my life. I'm going to break it down. I have a job, super grateful. Um, so if you were building your brand today, day one, you have a job, a great job, you need to be responsible to that job. How many hours do you have a day? To yourself? And, to uh, yourself. So if you have a job, before I can answer for sure, I'm gonna need to know how many hours does your job take out of your day? Well, it takes 10. Okay. The job takes 10. Okay. I need to sleep six, okay. seven, I need seven. Okay, but good. Six is great. Um, no, it's just seven fucking hours, it's a lot of hours. I'm excited already, keep going. <laughs> but you know, I work seven days, so I yeah, do. You have, you have 10 that you work, seven that you sleep, and seven hours in a day that are yours to do shit. No, but I'm saying I go seven days, so. I got it, you got yeah, 49 yeah, yeah. hours a week to do damage. Exactly. I understand. So what would you guys tactically do to make more money, or where would you prioritize your time? Like, what would you, if you're talking about building brand, I'm a chef, I've been doing it 27 years, so I'm trying to get to the next place, retire as a chef, professionally, uh, and move to the next spot, right? Whether it's a show, whether it's, you know, scaling myself. But is know? the next spot financial, or is it, or is it, like, Something that you well, it's buy. legacy. It's legacy. For me, it's legacy. I mean, you don't invest 27 years without thinking about what I've already invested as a chef. So it's legacy dominated. So it's not about the short term money, but it is about the money because how do I eventually retire as a private chef, as a chef, period, so that I could focus 100% on on building brand. So like tactically, I wanna know, what would you guys do if you were me with 27 years deep? Lizette, real quick, yeah. you, you were saying that, I just wanna make sure I understand this question. You're saying that you want to retire. Because it takes up 10 hours. So right? you're saying you don't want to be a private chef anymore. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I mean like it's physically, it's just too, it, it's, it's enough. I understand. Right, so how, how would you do it? I mean, it's hard to imagine you guys being a chef, but try to put your- Be careful, I'm about to fucking- No, no, no. Okay, let's go, I'll bring Don't you Don't challenge in. me, because yeah. I'm fucking- yeah. I make a I'll mean make bowl of cereal. I mean, yeah, no, 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 but like, just put on the chef hat and every little dynamic that I gave you, uh, what would you do with that? Like, how would you take that and go? Uh, so I actually have a client that's a chef, right? And Instagram, He's got 450,000 followers. Facebook, 1,000. YouTube, 500. Twitter, 50, right? Why so has like, he got 450 on Instagram? For because real, he don't knows me. what fits on Instagram, right? He makes it on a wood, kind of like this look. It's just oh, rustic. Know. Dennis the Press got his name, right? Love him, yep. he's amazing. But he knows burgers stacked with cheese falling works. How and long so, has he been on Instagram? Mm, two and a half, maybe three years. And for Correct real, for wrong. real, because this matters to me, why did he explode? Did he have a viral post? Did influencers put him on, like Shondoris and Tanner Fox? Did he buy ads? Like, what's the punchline? Some of it was organic, and he played the into the audience that he had, which was a female. And so he knew who he needed to connect with within that world. At the time, he had kind of a Facebook group type situation. Andy, Andy I apologize. Andy, for real, the 400,000 to 4.2 million. When I got fucking pissed on that vacation and got serious, how big of a factor was 60 Second Club? Like, first I started posting more with hashtags. I did I immediately go out and start doing JV with shout outs from other posts, or was it content? I mean, 60 Second Club was insanity when I first did it. Like, it was just a tactic that I came up with. I'm like, seriously, real talk. Like, that was the first thing that got. I remember doing that because that was December. I went on the vacation. I was still in. Flo I went off the grid to the island. Then I was in Florida and already came up with Sixty Second Club because I was really giving a fuck, and that really worked at the time because the algorithm favored that many comments in that short of a time. Right? Yeah, I would say it was a trifecta of that first happening. Yes. Shoutouts and then realizing how big the content. It was just. But, but I think also with even Gary's, right? If Gary went down some of my other clients I work with and he did Orbeez and pranks, you see him coming out of his glass office. Ugh. Like I have clients that that does 5 million views. 
for Gary, that doesn't work, right? You Be guys careful. don't care I'm about, about to him. the fuck out of you. <laughs> Give me a sneak. someone, right? It's so like, you have to feed into your audience, I think. But is, your chef, dude, did he have a cookbook as well, I think? So he released later after he had gotten okay. some traction. So I think okay. Dennis is the example. Just the point is find what fits in your audience, right? Find what they like and, and keep feeding them. Lizette. If you notice, his every fifth, fourth post is a burger. Lizette, I'm telling you right now, because obviously we've known each other a long time, I swear, and I've been watching enough to know, I literally think you should flip shit. I can't, be, like, out of all the things watching you try to do different things, like when you tried to buy those printer cartridges, when yeah. I saw that, I was like, yes. I'm like, this is going to be her, like if she, re like to me, nothing on earth right now, there's the amount, okay, take 100 people that have talent or interest and say, you're gonna be a personal brand and make 100,000 a year, right? 100 people have interest. Into Star Trek, can, sh can be a chef, can be into wine, sneaker, music authority, like whatever you wanna be. 100 people, go be an influencer that makes 100,000 a year from branded deals, speaking, and being that human, right? Like we do. Take that same 100 people and say, retail arbitrage. Go to fucking TJ Maxx, go to thrift stores, go to, ready? The 100 people, Every 100 people, one, two, as an influencer, get to 100,000 a year, 50. Get to 100,000 a year flipping stuff. So don't be romantic about what I sell. Just Period. sell, just sell. Period. If you want to get, if you're tired and you want to get to the financial freedom of not having to do something for 10 hours a day. Well, but no, no, no. I mean, you know the cost to this. The minute I stop earning money as a chef, and let's say I get to the 100K, right? I've sold my tail off, I have the 100K. That goes really quick if you're now getting a D Rock yeah, but, but, and, but, but you that, know. That's, no, so, so this is the part I don't no, know. No, no, I think you're m missing the point. I think you should just, once you make the 100K with TJ Maxx, thrift stores, and garage sales, while you're still a chef in your seven hours a day, Yeah posting on fucking Etsy and Craigslist, packing, like real life. Once you do that, you don't quit being a chef and start trying to build being the chef brand. You go and take those 10 hours and make 430,000 a year flipping stuff. So at what point, like can I, what is the timeline that I say I have a 24 month plan to not be a chef anymore. Like, is that how you work it? To well, let me tell you how I did it. I mean, I think people are completely, utterly fucking confused on how zero amount of money I had when I was 34 years old and started VaynerMedia. If I had money, I wouldn't have started the company in somebody else's conference room. Like, like I did it. I had to rely on the $100,000 a year salary I had from Wine Library while I was building Vayner because this wasn't giving me any money in the first two years. So I had to live back and forth. Like when you're siphoning off of something, you know, the time limit is whenever the threshold of you making enough to get you off the other thing based on your overhead. Got it. Right? Okay. So like, do you need 100? Do you need 47? Like, you know, like if you're in a rent control department in New York, that person could do it easier than somebody who isn't. There's so many variables. Well, okay, so the wrinkle to that is I'm a live-in chef. So I know. that's a huge, I mean, I don't that's pay rent advantage. in New York. Just imagine that. That's huge. Are you fucking kidding me? It's humongous. That's huge. So, to, to and me, I did that on purpose. As you should. It's a smart move. I think... I'm gonna say it again and I'm saying, you know, I'm obviously giving you advice because I've been watching, but this is advice for everybody else. The amount of people that are talented enough to make 100,000 a year being a personal brand is more than people think and less than people think. And one has to be self-aware to figure it out. You've been hacking at it for a while. I think it's quicker for you to get to a hundo by fucking thrifting and flipping, okay. I just do. I mean, okay. when I tell you that I'm watching this all go down, let me tell you one place that I think you could play in. I'm unbelievably fascinated with fashion and jewelry because my game is nostalgia. So I'm really good at like buying the fucking teddy bears and the video games and the stuffed animals, but they have a tangible value, right? When Justin and I look them up and be like, oh fuck, this South Park fucking piece of duty is $27, you look that up. The people that I think have the biggest advantage in the flip game are people that have an eye, that can go to a thrift store it doesn't have to say, you know, Knicks championship or OP or polo. It just looks cool. And they're like, that's cool. And I'm gonna like fucking just merchandise it on Etsy or let go of Mikado or whatever in this way. Or I'm gonna buy this brooch for 20 fucking five cents at this garage sale 
because it looks vintage retro. I know how to write the copy. I know how to make it look fresh. And I'm just gonna price it at $69.99. Oh man, I, you listen, you guys have all seen it if you're paying attention. I can't get off of these, you know, there are people who do it for real. But the people that are going from zero to 50 or 100,000, I can't get it out of my mind of how real it is in a world where most Americans don't make 100,000 a year. I don't know what to say. I got a buddy that in the spring, we live in Maine, in the spring he buys, uh, Alan Baruby, Salco, Maine, again. Um, he buys snow plows and snow blowers and in the fall he sells them and he's killing it with this, I'm telling you. It's, it's really, I mean, it's a lot bigger scale than a thrift, but it's. If you buy basketball stuff on eBay in the off season and then repost it when the season starts up again, there's a 20 to 40% delta. If you go to stores when they have sales or closeouts or closing, you know how many people could have made $100,000 just by going to Toys R Us loading up when it was going out of business? And like, the utter arb, I like the thrill of the hunt. I don't want scalability in flipping because it doesn't get me off. I don't want to buy 5,000 things from China and sell them on Amazon Marketplace. That doesn't, that's not what I want to do, right? I've lived that game, I sold a billion dollars worth of wine, fine. That's buying and selling. I love going and finding fucking strawberry shortcake for 25 cents for nine bucks. And I'm like, this is the fucking greatest. But if I I wanted to make real money, there's so much in retail arbitrage, it's almost utterly uncomfortable. And if you're a creative person who like really just loves like, buying and selling t-shirts from thrift stores in America at scale is just in perpetuity. If you, especially if you know how to write copy and get an eye and really start learning and then eventually, like I was doing this before you had a phone and could look up shit. So I memorized everything. I go to garage sales like nine, 17, 14, 23, four, seven, nine, 30, like, you know, like me and AJ were joking this week and I called him because I can never, like there's, outside of going to Jet Games, there's nothing more fun for me. And I was like, I always ask him this. I'm like, bro, what would happen if I just fucking went off the reservation and retired and just did this? I'm like, how much do you think I can make? Like, I always ask him that. Yeah. And it was funny, he was like, dude, I think in a year or two you'd make millions. And I'm like, yeah, because really what I would do is just hop, buy a bunch of trucks and just buy out everybody's garage sale. Like, and that's like my way, the much better way. But by the way, I'm trying another better way right now. Just out of my own curiosity, I've been buying a bunch of bulk, like magazine type stickers and different shit on eBay and just going to relist them on Amazon Marketplace just to learn to give people, like this has been such a fun content pillar for me because it's my hobby, but no thing I've ever done has made more people that needed more money than this because I'm not trying to do it like some people who do it for hundreds of thousands or millions, like $10,000 extra a year for somebody that really needs it is like insanity. And it's sitting there. And the Craigslist free, like watching people, you know, what's weird about Craigslist free is you have to be a real gangster because shit's big. Like it's not like buying a bunch of stuff, like you have to be like willing to like get a truck and pick up a fucking video game for 10 bucks free and like resu- but like people are like, like, you know, my whole thing is like, listen, I, you know, this is funny. I never talk about Dover, New Jersey. I lived in Dover for a year before we went to Edison. And I never even like, I always wonder why I don't bring it up. I'm like, we went from Queens to Edison. It's not true. We went from Queens to Dover to Edison. And it's really interesting. I've been asking myself lately, like, why did I not, why did that not happen? Like, why did I just say that? And maybe because it was a year, maybe it was the first time I ever talked, I just said it, and then that became the thing. But it was interesting. It was a really tough time in my life that year, right? Like, I got picked on the most because I couldn't speak English. I remember a very scary event with my dad with kidney stones, so that always scares me. I always still get freaked. But what, it was a very hard time. We didn't have a car. Like, me and my mom used to, like, sometimes I talk about it, walk three fucking miles to Kmart. Like, like, and what I think about that time, or like how my sister, literally my sister when we first came to America in Queens, everything she owned came from the garbage. My sister's fucking thing that she sat in as a baby was a car seat that my cousin Bobby found in the garbage. Like we brought a car seat into our studio apartment and she sat in it. Like, and, the, like, and so when desperate times, desperate measures, like fuck, this Craigslist eBay, free. Come to my house, take it, and repost to like to fifty thousand a year if you're just willing to bleed and don't give a fuck that you're walking around town with like TVs and fucking strollers and fucking humidifiers and fucking <laughs> cinder blocks and fucking like you you can get. 
pallets on Amazon of returns. So you can buy a return pallet of, from Amazon and it comes in. Some of them don't work and some of them are okay, but some of them are amazing. They just open the package and I'm like, I don't want this and turn it back and you can. We've obviously spent a lot of time in this. Make one margin. out of 100, 50 out of 100. That I can't, you know, whether that's right math or not, that's my intuitive answer to that question. That's crazy. And what I really like about it is my biggest thesis is if you love something, you'll win. The fact that you can sell everything allows everybody to love something. Like I know waffle makers make a fuckload of money on the flip. I know in garage sale culture, finding waffle makers. Right, Justin? (laughs) Calculators kill. The bottom line is, like everything kills. Like everything is fucking there for the taking. You just have to fucking want it. And I love when every time, you know, I've been tweeting about a lot and doing a lot on it, people are like, yeah, but what about the eBay fees and the shipping? I'm like, you charge the customer shipping. I think like, an overlaying theme here is creativity. We talked about the jewelry boutique that I started my literal first business. I had $400 in the bank. I didn't know I was gonna start it. I didn't think it was gonna be a business. It was just an experiment to learn how to do stuff online. I hit up the companies and said, hey, I'm a big time jewelry guy. I'm gonna be launching a huge boutique. Can you send me some of your products so I can see what the quality is to see if I wanna learn more? My first 100 cells were necklaces they sent me to check out the quality. And then from there, I had made another $400 and then I started doing small orders and I didn't do my first order until two months into the game with my actual money. The thing that blows me away is the people that have the least ability to be fancy are the ones that are the most fancy. Beggars can't be choosers. I love doing dirt shit. You know, like people give me excuses all the time. Like, uh, I'm like, you have no leverage. You want more money? You want to get to the next step? You have to like do whatever. And like people are like, oh, I'm not fucking waking up at six o'clock to go through somebody's garbage. I'm like, cool, sit on your fucking couch and complain on Twitter that this is fake. You know, like these are the interactions. I'm, I'm like, and you don't see a lot of stuff. I'm DMing people like, you're a fucking loser. <laughs> like you're sitting here saying this is bullshit. Like here's everybody that's real as fuck. You want a DM you, from Gary, like just you, complain. Like, like you, it is true. Like, like, like it's the greatest, te- the person that says no with no knowledge is the greatest tell to a losing DNA. And so, I just think people are fancy out here, like they, right? Like people are fancy out here, like they're gonna be VC backed or they're gonna be fucking Casey. Like, go fucking make $50,000 selling t-shirts. It's literally right here, it's in your fucking face. Retail arbitrage is something they will talk about in 50 years because the data is so disgusting. You have to be super basic and you can make money. Like you, it's. Important. One more question, we're out. Hi, Rabia Sutton. So my question is more around, back to the conversation of the transition. So you had a jewelry store, you're doing stuff for your family business, and when you decided to kind of embark on the personal brand and like what those first couple of steps were. For me, the first couple of steps were, you know, don't forget how long ago it was. It was acknowledging its existence. And so, again, we just spent a whole lot of time saying one out of 100 versus 50 out of 100, but like, for me, knowing a little bit about you, you're a prime, you know, where I think Lizette has to make decisions on like, what's the right move because I want to get off this thing. You have a business, and now it's like layering on top of it versus I want to get off my business. And maybe you do in the long term, but I think every one of us has different things. Like I wanted an identity outside of something that, you know, you know, I needed that. Like now it's easy for me to talk about at the time, like it was subconscious. Like I, you know, like I knowing what I was doing for my family business and knowing that the narrative was gonna be I was put on when I felt like I was putting on, I was like, I need something else to like make this very clear to the world. The fuck is going on? That was my own shit, right? We all have our own shit. I think you for you, you have so many things. Like personally, like here's the transition. You have to create content. Like that's, you're, you're set, cause you have stuff, right? Yeah. Like you have stuff, and, and again, same with Lizette, like others, like this is the great, I mean, being a minority woman today is like the great advantage, your timing's amazing. You, you do, it's just the truth. There's a lot of interest in it, there's need it for it, there's demand for it, it's like more doors are open than ever, that's just fucking facts, so you need to run through them and not say shit, that was the one window. Right. Like, I was just telling these guys, I'm like, I never talked to Steve Ross. 
Steve Ross is my business partner. He achieved what I want. He owns the Dolphins. And they're three and all those fuckers, right? <laughs> He's the best dude ever. He like best. Like literally I'm like fuck, that's what I'm gonna be. Like that's how I see it, just the best. I talk to him three hours a year. I don't talk to him at all. And once in a while when I talk to him, and it's just fun, it's not even like mentorship, it's just like I love him. I walk out of there every time, right Alex? Three fucking hours a year, never, I never talk to him. And I, I, every time I walk out I'm like, dude, dude's 78. Like, and I hope he lives to a thousand, but I always leave there, I'm like, I'm a fucking idiot. One day I'm gonna be like, man, I should have spent 100, 500 extra hours with this incredible man. Um, you're gonna do the same thing. This is your golden era, right now. It's happening right the fuck now. There's never been a better time to be you. Right, you've done it and you've got the optics that the, like unlimited demand. You cold email Forbes and Fastco and everybody, they're interested. And guess what, it will go away. Just like everything else, and you'll be like, "Fuck! I had a window from you know late 17 to you know to 21, and I didn't fucking squeeze it." No different than Facebook and Instagram ads that I always cry about. You need to produce content. The transition is write a fucking LinkedIn post about what was difficult, or how the government works, or how you do it, or what you thought, or da 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 da. Knowing that I know, you know. Okay. W- one last one. So, all right. My name is uh, Max Maxwell from North Carolina as well. Um, so Max, I took you, Maxwell? M- Max Maxwell. Oh. <laughs> Man, if my name was Max Maxwell, I'd have at least four million more followers. <laughs> Go ahead, my guy. So I took your advice 10 months ago, started documenting what I do. I'm, in real, I'm a real estate investor. Um, kind of exploded. Now it's like I'm at the point where, you know, real estate stuck for me. You know, I'm an entrepreneur by heart, but it, you know, you throw shit at the wall and that's what happened and worked. But I feel like I'm being boxed in as the guy that talks about real estate. But, Max Maxwell, we just answered this one. Yeah. Until you start talking about beard oils or watches or fucking kicks or wine or fucking the Redskins. So how do I make that, so I wanna just talk Just make more, the content. Just start doing it. This is, where, listen, this is where I always talk about like watch, you know how I'm always like, I don't know yeah. if you know, like watch Absolutely. what I, yeah, I, like everyone's like you can't do that, I'm like why? In a fucking real estate episode, whatever you want to talk about next, throw it in and watch what happens. People are people. Like in real life, we like each other for the layers. Like yeah, we might be homies because we both liked that video game, but then later we find out we both love root beer floats and riding bikes and fucking da, 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 da. Like, like I don't understand how people don't understand this. Like people are so ingrained. You know what it is, man? This is all about ideology. Everybody's in their own fucking, I, right? This is, we're all stuck in our ideology. Oh, I'm the real estate dude, I can't. Like, I don't know, like, make your next, dude, I'm out there fucking buying shit at garage sales and flipping it. Do you know how insane that is to people? Do you know what kind of weird emails I get from my friends? They're like, yo, are you okay? Like, are you good? Like, you know you're like ruining, like, like, so I literally just ran from here. I was literally just at the Google building with Eric Schmidt and the president of Cuba, right? That's where I was just was. Same. Before I, right? Same. <laughs> so that's, so like one of the homies that's in that meeting is like, literally this week I was like, dude, on Monday, you're gonna be at Google headquarters with Eric Schmidt and the president of Cuba and today, you're out garage selling at seven in the morning buying people's old trash. What are you doing? And I text him back, I was like, yeah, and last night I was with Sam Darnold at, like, at a super hot spot in New York City and more people came up to take selfies with me than him. I'm like, this is my life. And guess what? Mike Vacanti, you know Mike, my old trainer, if any of you know, like, he texted me wallet and he's like, yo, my mom just called me. She just had to call me and say, her favorite content of yours is when you're garage sailing. <laughs> It's definitely the place I'm most creative. I like take a still shot. Like I don't do that shit normally. Like I'm like trying to be out there like a fucking real creator. I'm like, oh, man, I fucking missed it. It didn't work out. Like leaving New York. Like like you know like. You could do whatever the fuck you want. And for the 13% that ditch you because they're like, yo, I'm here for real estate, Max Maxwell. Don't be talking to me about sneakers. You're gonna pick up 29% that are in a net score. You're gonna win. Because the biggest advantage we have is I'm real estate dude, I love fucking snow globes, I like love the Raiders, I eat pizza, like my brother's my best, like the, the advantages we have are the layers and everybody's trying to sell vanilla when everybody wants to buy chocolate. I'm selling because I'm chocolate, not just like I'm an, one thing. We're missing the layers, everybody's trying to vanilla themselves. 
into like, I'm the cryptocurrency gal. And you're an awesome sister, and you're great at skiing, and you have thoughts about, you know, Tiger Woods coming back, and you love, like, you're a foremost expert on fucking peanut butter and jelly. You see what I mean? Go ahead. I think that a lot of people are watching you because they dig Max Maxwell. So you need to tell the people your story. Why are you moving to the next thing and why should they come and why is it gonna be interesting? I think if you build this rapport with your audience over the next couple days, weeks, and then transition them to something else, they're gonna come because they love you, not just real estate. And there's maybe people that are watching you for real estate, but then they, they learn what a baller you are and you're doing X, Y, or Z over here. They wanna learn more about it and they get motivated and then that audience comes and then you become friends with them and then you move on to the next thing. I went from jewelry boutique to Snapchat to YouTube to eSports to like, dad, those things aren't connected now most of your all. content's dad. It's like, yeah. Look at Gary, I'm a Gary, family vlogger now. I used Gary, to be a skateboarder. Selling on the streets, but Gary. But that's the other thing. CEO. But there is no dad Gary because that's a thing we decided to go the other way. So it's not everything. It's, you gotta be you, right? Like, like, I went completely private on the family part. Like, everyone's doing their own thing, but that's your strength and your uniqueness. And to Sean Doris's point, he's probably right about like build it up and convert. I'm just like, fuck them. Just make a barber video out of nowhere. And they're like, what the fuck? Am I on the right channel? Is that Max Maxwell? What the fuck? Like, it all can work. Like, it's true. Like, it just can all work. And I think people are overthinking it and they self identify, but I think we're going too vanilla and I'm trying to push creators and vloggers and individuals and businesses to like show all the layers. Because there's a lot of, there's people that literally bought my sneakers because I'm a Jets fan. Like literally that is the single reason. Not I made content for them, not that they associate with entrepreneurship, but like we're a small little community and we're mad at everybody and like he's a Jets fan so fuck it, I need a new pair of sneakers. Like you, you gotta give people more reasons, not less. Like, and you weren't even that guy 10 months ago. So again, we're overthinking like, and we're, you know, by the way, let me give you some real good news. Nobody gives a fuck. You know why everything works for me? Nobody gives a fuck. Like, you know, like we get way too serious on ourselves. If I tomorrow start being the Play-Doh dude, like at the end of the day, everyone who's sad here like, fuck, I really loved when he did business fucking content. Like, I'm not about this Play-Doh life. Like. I promise you this, when I go fully into Play-Doh and 24-7, there's no business for you and you're like, fuck, that sucked because we loved it. Like, you'll all leave and do your thing. I promise you, a month later, you'll forget. I, like, you'll be like, maybe because it was good for you, you'll go back and watch your favorite episode or piece of content, but like, it's gonna be okay. Like, and, and I really started realizing that when iconic people were dying in the last five years, I watch. And I'm like, fuck. And I say this often, if Prince only gets a day and a half, then like, nobody gives a fuck, Max Maxwell. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if Prince only gets a day and a half before everybody moves on and nobody gives a fuck, well then we better get real serious about what the fuck are we really and realize I, I navigate every day knowing nobody gives a fuck. And so thus it makes me very easy to do my thing and like let the chips fall. And I think that kind of level of humility to go along with the confidence to do whatever the fuck you want, that contradiction, that's where all the fucking magic is. Like who, like, like you can't make that transition because what? Somebody's gonna leave a comment and be like, yo, I fucking came here, I subscribed for that real estate stuff. Like, you, you know, like they do that to me all the time. And I'm like, cool, like there's nine trillion more of that coming and there's nine million in the back and like there's other people that can feed you. Like today it's about fucking buying Barbies and flipping it. You got it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, everybody here. I'm looking forward to jamming with you now in a few minutes. Uh, everybody watching, thank you for listening or watching the Ask Gary V Show. No even question of the day. We're just wrapping up. This one totally different tune. Thank you so much, Doris Holiday. Thank you so much. See ya. Bye.